Okay. Right. So, first of all, make sure we understand our product suite and tenor behavior. A statement of the obvious, you might think, but one would be surprised how many senior people one comes across in a bank that aren't necessarily as au fait with individual products as they should be. Now, they've only got themselves to blame. If you say to me, oh, well, listen, you know, I've spent 25, 30 years in the marketplace, and now I'm the CRO or the CFO or the CEO. You can't possibly expect me to know every single product on the balance sheet. Well, actually, I do. <laughs> and you've only got yourself to blame. If you have very complex products on the balance sheet and you don't understand them, which they wouldn't admit it, but it's a truism, then don't have them on the balance sheet, okay? Uh, many uh, a CRO or indeed business line head will think it's okay to have this product because we understand it when in reality one can't really hedge it, okay? And I was thinking of that Note, that's right, an FX TARN note. Has anyone come across it? T-A-R-N, Target Asset Return Note. FX T-A-R-N, right? Have you come across it? Unlikely because very few banks do it, okay? But this is a note that has a very long dated tenor, let's say 20 years or 30 years. It sells to an investor and it has a target return. Now, it could say be 20% or 30%, okay? Now, the return isn't just, oh, it's straight interest rate, oh. 8%. It's linked to various other pricing factors. For example, an FX rate, a commodity price, a FTSE 100 level, what have you. And all these together make up the return. And you will make that ultimate advertised return, let's say 20%, in the life of the note. You might make 1% this year, but between now and the maturity, you'll make all of it. Right? This is a note that cannot be traded or hedged or priced. Does that stop banks from dealing with them? No. I don't mean lots of banks, just one or two. My point is this understand the product from a risk management and behavior, price behavior point of view, or don't trade in it, okay? Or don't transact in it, okay? So first of all, now, you might think, oh, well, he's about to give us a whole lot of complex things. Not at all. I only want you to understand the cash flow impact on the balance sheet, okay? This really is the be all and end all. We need to understand the nature of every single product on the balance sheet from a cash flow impact perspective. What does that mean? That means when I transact it, whether I buy or I sell it today, or it's a hedging instrument, so I've got it on the balance sheet to hedge some other cash flow impact, I understand the cash flows, and I understand how these cash flows change though, for any market, changes in market factors, internal or external. Okay? This is it's like a, a baseline. I need to know it. And I don't need to just work in the risk management department to know it. Any part of the bank should understand it. Okay? So... Notwithstanding the large variety of product types transacted by different banks, all we are really concerned with is the cash flow impact. So the timing of the cash flows, okay, the repayment, the interest rate, the variability, the FX element, just how the cash flow changes the changes in the marketplace. This is very important. One has to understand this. And one has to understand it for every product. Okay, so make that an objective of yours just generally in the day job. Whatever you do in the day job, understand how the product impact the balance sheet, okay? Speaking of the payment the stage, it's very straightforward, okay? Uh, assets and liabilities. On the cash side, mortgages, term loans, credit cards, so on others. Liability side, current accounts, calling accounts. This is commercial banking. Now, this is a very short list, okay? And others. This is for you to do. Uh, reading, the course X, chapter one, appendix one. Is there an extract from that? Yes, there's an extract from that, okay? The different types of products one has. Actually, this is the services. These are the services one offers. The products one is one for you to consider, okay? As you know, I mean, one could write an entire thousand-page book on the different types of products. You have to understand them. <clears throat> I must admit, from the day job point of view, one only needs to understand products on one's own balance sheet. If you're lucky enough not to sell tar notes to investors, then who cares about them, right? So, of course, you want to understand your own balance sheet products, all right? When I've got there, add others, I mean... That's for you to do, okay? Add the others. Be familiar with them, all right? Familiar, so, so for the forum, here's something for the forum as well. Maybe you want to discuss or the product range and critique it for errors and emissions. What are the issues of more complex products? By that, I mean there is a very basic plain vanilla product range, okay? What's missing? Well, obviously, everything is derivative-based, okay? Commodities, equities, so on and so forth, okay? These are the basic ones that are missing. The point is, be familiar with your bank's product range, Okay? in terms of the cash flow impact of the balance sheet. That's, that's the, the key message. Okay. And the services as well. Services are less of a concern to me personally, I must admit. I am, I mean, obviously from a customer, customer service point of view, 
service is very important because <laughs> whatever you're doing, you want to do it well for your customer. I'm more concerned with the cash flow impact on the balance sheet. So whatever the service is, then you want to, one wants to understand the cash flow impact of providing that service. Now, some of them don't generate any balance sheet risk. Take, um, take, take the one on the investment banking debt, mergers and acquisitions. I mean, these, if one is underwriting a transaction, that's a pretty chunky balance sheet risk. On the other hand, if one is merely advising on a transaction, well, that's a pretty chunky fee-based income. There's no risk to me. The deal is done or the deal is not done, I get my fee. Just like a lawyer, okay? Nice work if you can get it. Whereas some of these others will have various balance sheet risk impacts. Take factoring, project finance, leasing, invoice finance, okay? All the trade finance, okay? These are plain vanilla products. One needs to understand them, okay? Right. Two things you want to understand on the balance sheet. One is the cash flow impact. Two is the tenor behavior, okay? The tenor behavior is everything. Remember, the cons- what are the constraints on the balance sheet of any new business? Liquidity and capital, I would add to that expertise, okay? Let's not kid ourselves that we can do any product going with any customer in any jurisdiction because we can't, okay? No individual bank can, although one or two like to kid themselves that they can, all right? Uh, so most banks will have a, well, they should have a know your risk ethos, you know, stick to the knitting, so to speak, is the expression that one uses or one comes across. Uh, so you know the so that's a constraint, but the other constraints are of course capital and liquidity. Okay, so with respect to the liquidity, I want to understand the tenor behaviour of all these products. They will have a contractual tenor, very good example, residential mortgage, twenty five years, and a behavioural tenor, which will be, which could well be the contractual one, but often is something different to that. So understand the the tenor behaviour of every product as well. Look at the difference. Here is a UK commercial bank from 2012. You've got the contractual. You'll see this chart again when we do liquidity risk later on in the course. On the top, you've got the the tenor behavior contractually. And then the one beneath is the tenor behavior behaviorally, expected life or behavioral life. Much less of a mismatch, isn't it? But of course, behavioral, I can only take in as business as usual, non-stressed market behavior. So the behavioral one is not 100% confirmed at any time, just as the contractual one isn't 100% fixed at any time, okay? (laughs) So you're left in the interesting position of not having a a fixed tenor chart that is actually what it's going to be at any time beyond today. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Just to be clear, this is is the interesting thing about banking, okay? You've got a contractual ALM chart, for tenor, for tenor purposes, maturity purposes, and you've got a behavioral chart for tenor purposes, maturity purposes, and neither of them actually is the real one, is it? <laughs> if we take the longest tenor bucket, let's say the longest product on my balance sheet is a contractual maturity of 25 years, maybe an expected maturity of seven years, and everything in between. If I produce this chart today, the contractual and the behavioral one, and then I fast forward to seven years and then 25 years, None of those charts would have been the actual picture. Does anyone start to think about that? So whatever chart you get, you get the most sophisticated MI going, right, of any, any bank, take your pick, right? And you, you get the ALM chart in front of you for any purposes, for FTP purposes, for liquidity risk purposes, or for interest rate risk purposes. You've got your, you've got your tenor bucket there. And no matter how you cut the cake or you construct that histogram, none of them are actually really going to transpire. Do you see what I mean? So this is all, we do our risk management on the basis of an estimation at all times. It's always an estimate. It's never more than an estimate. It will never, ever be actually what transpires. Just think about that. You don't actually have the solid 100% information, right? If we were planning, it's just as well that, you know, if we are doing something genuinely rocket science, this expression, it ain't rocket science. I mean, it's a cliched and a tired expression, but I'm fed up of hearing it in finance because finance really isn't. No part of finance is rocket science. If I was trying to place some landing craft on an asteroid 200 million miles from here, now that's a complex mathematical task to work out, right? And it has to be actually what transpires. Whereas in finance, none of this actually transpires, okay? There's always an estimate. But anyway, that's life, okay? Forgive me for just spending a couple of minutes of your time telling you the blinding of the obvious. 
But I don't think enough people stop to think about the fact that your MI, whether it's a value at risk number or a histogram like that or anything else, isn't actually what transpires. Okay? We should always remember that. Right. Okay, onwards.